Over to you, well, thank okay. you very much. Thank you, Helen, for your support and thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Dirk Jacobson uh, and I would like to start the talk with what this is all about. So it's about three things today. First, we will investigate how dental health is in general in such a dismal state today and how that relates to germ theory. The second, we will look at all the amazing connections between the mouth and the body and that most dentists are not even aware of. And third, I will provide some useful insights and practical tips that you can take home already and hopefully start healing your mouth today. So let's dive into it. The mouth is the gateway to systemic health, however germ theory is clogging the entrance. So let's have a look at um, the current state of dental health and I just present you with a few numbers. So this is from the British Oral Health Report from 2021 and it's about dental decay. 970,000 families have children whose teeth have needed to be extracted in hospitals under general anesthetic, uh, while a further 1.2 million families have children where a tooth was extracted by a general dentist. 23.4% of five-year-old children in England had experience of dental decay. And one-third of the population is suffering from uh, untreated tooth decay. This is from the National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Surge, uh, Research. And it's not, not much better there. 5% of adults have lost all their teeth by the age of 65. And over 90% have had dental decay. This is about gum disease and 50 to 90 percent have some sort of gum disease. And this is about crooked teeth and impacted wisdom teeth and uh, that orthodontic disorders are also at epidemic levels. 90 percent have some sort of crooked teeth and 75 percent have impacted wisdom teeth. To summarize that, uh, these are absolutely shocking numbers. And I'm sure that most, if not all of us, in the room are in some way affected by these sorts of diseases. So uh, the current state of dental health should be more appropri appropriately named the current state of non-dental health. <laughs> uh, so, And we have to ask ourselves, there is billions of dollars spent every year and still uh, this situation is absolutely catastrophic. Something is wrong at the heart of conventional dentistry and if we are not addressing the issue, it, it will not get any better. Allopathic medicine is compartmentalizing the human body into multiple different organs and segments. And there's a doctor for everything, a doctor for the kidney, for the lungs, for the heart, for the skin, for the psyche, for the nerves, for everything. And there's a doctor also for, for teeth, that's me, that's dentists. However, there is no such thing that any organ is separated from the rest of the body and oral health and systemic health are closely linked. Even more so because the mouth is the gateway to the body and it's the principal portal into our bodies. It interfaces, absorbs and assimilates the world around us. Teeth are alive and live in a dynamic relationship with the whole body. So. The mouth and the body are connected on multiple levels uh, via the blood vessels. So the same blood that is flowing uh, through our teeth is flowing also through the rest of the body. And teeth are connected neurologically with our brain and there is a constant feedback system uh, that is continuously communicating with each other. So the brain always knows what the state of the teeth is all about. And teeth are also connected to the body on an energetic level um, that is based on the meridians of traditional Chinese medicine. This is a chart that shows how every tooth is related to a particular organ system. Uh, for example, the stomach or, and the pancreas, they are related to the bottom premolars and to the upper molars. So, if there's a problem with the tooth, it's worthwhile looking if the related organ also has a problem or vice versa. And sometimes that gives you good insight about what's going on in the body. 
And there's also a hormonally controlled lymph flow that connects the gut with the teeth. Um, it starts in the gut and it travels up to the jawbone and through the jawbone into the teeth. And then through the roots of the teeth into the center of the tooth, uh, which is the pulp. So we are now in the center of the tooth, but the lymph flow does not stop here. Uh, as you can see, there are three layers in the tooth. So we've got the enamel, that's the outer surface, and then in the center is the pulp, and the pulp contains uh, the nerves, the lymph system, and also the blood vessels. And in between those, that's, that's where the dentin is. And if we zoom in, <coughs> then we can see that the dentin contains of thousands of little dental tunnels, like they are called tubuli. So when the lymph flow goes into the center of the tooth, then it goes through these little tunnels, through the tubules, and it goes through the porous enamel outwards. And then we have a happy tooth because it's, it's this lymph flow outwards is acting like an internal toothbrush. Uh, it's like microscopic sweat that goes through the tooth. And the, the healthy tooth is continuously cleaning itself from the inside out and in a situation like that dental plaque does not settle on the tooth but uh, this fluid this fluid this flow can also be stagnant and it can go inwards and then the tooth acts like a sponge uh, and it can even get worse so in a situation like that the tooth acts like a sponge sucking in all the toxins and microorganisms from the outside in and when th this is an unhealthy state and in a situation like that uh, the plaque can easily settle on the tooth and this lymph flow is regulated by the hypothalamus so it, it depends on the food that we eat nutritious food activates the hypothalamus and then the hypothalamus sends signals to the parotid gland. Um, that's a big gland that sits somehow in the cheeks. Yeah? So it, it normally uh, uh, secretes all the saliva. So most of the saliva that we have in our mouth is uh, produced by the uh, parotid glands, which uh, sits in the cheek. There are also some salivary glands under the tongue, but most of it comes from the parotid gland. But it also has an endocrine function. Uh, just like the pancreas has an endocrine function, the, so the pancreas they, uh, produces some uh, f uh, some enzymes for digestion, but also it produces an endocrine uh, hormone, insulin. So the parotid gland produces uh, a hormone called parotid hormone. And this hormone activates the lymph flow. So that's when we have nurturing and healing the tooth from the inside out but with high sugar levels. So if we eat sugar or low carb food, then uh, the blood sugar level rises and then this lymph flow reverses. So that's when we have, uh, that's this actually the starting point of dental decay. Uh, so it starts actually with uh, some body problems related to sugar and then this lymph flow stops. That's when we start to develop a hole. So you can see on how many levels the mouth is connected to the rest of the body. It seems counterproductive that dentistry is so narrowly focused on teeth alone and that teeth are treated as a separate unit that is detached from the body. Now let's look at the oral microbiome or the microbiota, which is intimately connected to all other microbiomes in the body. Uh, but let's look at some numbers first, and these numbers are also staggering. So there are 10, the human microbiome is made up of 10 to 100 trillion microbes, primarily bacteria. And we as humans are made up of 10 times more microbes than human cells. Basically, the body is a superorganism, a composite of human <coughs> and microbial cells. And as I said, we've got 10 times more microbes than human cells within us. And these microbes, they merge into one big microbiome. 
and it's all connected. So we've got a nose microbiome in the mouth, we've got a lung microbiome, we've got a stomach microbiome in the colon, in our sexual organs, and we've got a microbiome on our skin. And they are all connected. There is a symbiotic relationship between us, the host, and the microbiome. We support the microbes and they support us. Uh, a good way of looking at it is that we are made of microbes. These microbes, they run us. And the best way to stay healthy in every respect, including our oral health, is to make peace with our microbes. Our health depends on a thriving microbiome. And as human hosts, the key to vitality in our bodies is uh, a bacterial balance. So the mouth is the gateway and distribution center to feed our whole body in a positive and in a negative way. Every time we swallow, thousands of bacteria are feeding the microbiome down the digestive system. And every time we breathe, we aspirate microbiome, uh, mi microorganisms that mingle then with the microbiome in the lung. And we, we absorb microorganisms and they can be washed into the bloodstream. Bacteria from the mouth does not normally enter our bloodstream under healthy conditions, but under unhealthy circumstances or with dental procedures and some dental products, the very uh, thin and delicate skin in our mouths, the oral mucosa, can perforate. Then bacteria and toxins have access to the underlying blood vessels. And the same happens when chemical toxins penetrate, penetrate the mucosa. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry is taking advantage of the absorbability through the oral mucosa to deliver drugs. So they are administered under the tongue and the, then they penetrate the mucosa and they are rapidly absorbed into the systemic uh, circulation. Under healthy circumstances, the oral mucosa should be sealing off the underlying tissue, but this barrier can be compromised. The way it works is a bit like in leaky gut syndrome. That's why people are calling it leaky mouth or leaky gums. Uh, here are the similarities. On the left, we see how the cells of the epithelial layer normally form a tight junction, but in a state of imbalance, the thin epithelial layer gets breached. So that toxins and uh, microbes can penetrate in between those cells and get to the tissue and blood vessels underneath and then into the bloodstream. So what is the oral microbiome and what is dental plaque? This is a simplified explanation. Plaque is a sticky film of bacteria that constantly forms on teeth. Bacteria and plaque produce acids after we eat or drink. These acids can destroy tooth enamel and cause cavities and gum disease. Conventional dentistry has a very simplistic way of explaining the most common dental problems, which are caries and gum disease. Uh, and bacteria are made the, cul the culprit. So bacteria in the mouth, they consume sugar and then uh, they multiply and they build up as plaque around our teeth. That's the sticky film. And then they cause caries and gum disease. So how can we prevent these problems from happening in the first place? What is the strategy? Uh, well, the strategy of modern dentistry is to destroy the bacteria, to avoid sugar, and then to destroy the plaque with brushing and chemicals and toothpaste and mouthwash. And then they add fluoride to the drinking water and every dental product, which is, as we know, toxic. <coughs> but here again, looking at the numbers, this approach is failing dismally. Let's look at the current paradigm under which dental health is governed. And that's germ theory. Allopathic medicine and dentistry, um, uh, they both operate under the paradigm of germ theory. To explain germ theory, uh, we also need to explain its grand, uh, the challenger, which is called terrain theory, which is a much more holistic way at looking at our health. 
And these theories, they have been at loggerheads with each other for more than a century. They are represented by two scientists, Louis Pasteur on the left and Antoine Bichon on the right. They lived in the late 1900s. Pasteur represents germ theory, whereby bacteria are causing the disease. And Bichon, he represents terrain theory, whereby the resilience of a person is weakened and then it's causing disease. So these are completely opposing views on health and how disease is developing. Obviously Pasteur's germ theory has gained way more traction in the medical and dental world because the whole world seems to be running on that theory. But that doesn't mean that it's right. Uh, looking at the commonly available health disciplines we can see a clear divide and who's subscribing to which theory. So uh, germ theory, allopathic medicine is, op is operating under germ theory, that's obvious. But also big pharma and dentistry in general, hospital care, that's all germ theory and mass vaccinations for example. And the constant surface dense infection that you see everywhere to kill germs and hand disinfection. And of course the face masks that are supposed to uh, protect us from, from any germs. Terrain theory, on the other hand, uh, homeopathy is aligning with uh, terrain theory, acupuncture, Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, holistic dentistry is going that way, or herbal medicine and bioterrain medicine. So their treatment modalities for any given disease involving microbes is very, very different. Germ theory is based upon the idea that the microbes are the enemy so they must be destroyed that's why I kill the germs so that's that's in germ theory happening in terrain theory on the other hand uh, terrain theory is concerned with strengthening the resilience of the body which requires to heal the terrain this is a classical example um, bacteria tonsillitis or strep throat so strep bacteria usually exist in the throat and mouth without causing any harm. But in bacterial tonsillitis, the number of strep bacteria has exploded. And modern medicine sees it as the culprit and causing agent for the disease. So if you see an ordinary allopathic doctor, you'll get a prescription for an antibiotic. Uh, by the way, the word antibiotic means against living organisms. So anyway, you probably also get some chemical gargling solution to kill the culprit strep bacteria. Unfortunately, there will be also collateral damage as all bacteria in the firing line will be destroyed, upsetting the whole microbiome uh, when that happens. So terrain theory has a different approach. First, it looks at it as there is an insult to the tissue, to the tonsils. It could be because of uh, maybe too much dairy products or otherwise weakened resilience in the body. As a, as a result, there is tissue damage and strep bacteria fulfill an important task. Uh, they clean up the tissue and by doing so, they create toxins. This causes symptoms like swelling and maybe fever and pain, pain when you swallow, but this is a very important part of the healing process. Antibiotics might kill the germs and relieve the symptoms for a while, but it interrupts and it also suppresses the healing process. And the problem will show up again because this process has not been completed. Besides, we are also faced with the collateral damage uh, that the antibiotics have done to the microbiome. So what would a holistic health professional uh, advise? Maybe get some rest, avoid dairy products, gargle with salt water maybe, drink lots of water and stay hydrated, maybe get a humidifier and have some hum honey turmeric tea, don't strain your voice and uh, treatment might be involve acupuncture or herbs or homeopathy. They are all designed to strengthen the terrain there's no collateral damage. It's all about uh, improving the body's response to the healing process. 
Here's a good analogy. In terrain theory, on the right, we make sure that the water stays clean so that the fish lives in a healthy environment and finds all the conditions to heal or to stay healthy in the first place. In germ theory, on the left, we don't really care too much about the filthy water. We medicate the fish and keep it in a plastic bag so that it's uh, separated from the water. Uh, in my opinion, naturopathic medicine had it uh, right all along because it's not about the bacteria but about the terrain and the environment. Now, anecdotally, these are the last words that Louis Pasteur has said uh, on his deathbed. Uh, he saw his ill ways with his germ theory, that's what we are told, and he was regretting his approach uh, and his support for germ theory. So what he's supposed to have said is, the microbe is nothing, the terrain is everything. This is a quote from Montague R. Leverson, uh, which explains the excellent business model, model behind germ theory. So what he says is, the germ theory of infectious disease, contagious disease, is convenient because it provides what every simplistic view of a problem seeks before all else, a culprit an invisible hair for the hounds to chase in their costly research labs, universities, hospitals and drug factories. The fact that the hair can never be caught is the perfect guarantee that their race will never finish, their demands for funding will never cease and their ability to generate profits for the drug and chemical corporations will continue to grow. So he saw it all coming more than a hundred years ago. So how does all of that relate to dentistry and dental health? Dentistry has identified dental plaque as the disease-causing agent and the main culprit for caries is streptococcus mutans. Now to be clear, strep mutans is not the only germ involved in dental decay but it's the main player. In gum disease we have other germs involved with other complicated names, but let's just focus on this one, strep mutants, to explain the fundamental processes that happen in our mouth when teeth get decayed. Strep mutants is a normal inhabitant of the oral microbiome and in a healthy and balanced microbiome or healthy terrain, strep mutants is one of many bacteria. And not only that, from a holistic point of view, strep mutants is an integral part of it. Microorganisms are not living with us by accident, by chance. They fulfill important functions like digestion or cleaning up waste products. Or in case of the oral microbiome, they produce a gas called nitric oxide. We are just starting to understand the importance of this little known gas for our overall health. Anyway, there are more than 750 different bacteria in the oral microbiome. They all live together in a nicely balanced, diverse community. They don't do any harm and there are, there's no such thing as good or bad bacteria. Only if the terrain is out of balance, strep mutants is taking over like a nasty bully, causing tooth decay. So when we eat sugar or when we are dehydrated, or when we take antibiotics or use chemicals in oral care products. That's when we are messing up the delicate balance in the oral microbiome or the terrain. So in a healthy state we experience homeostasis, which is a balanced diversity in the microbiome. In dysbiosis we have an imbalance of the microbiome. And in dysbiosis we have a decrease in beneficial microbes, an increase in pathogenic microbes and a reduction in diversity. So, however, when we talk about pathogenic microbes in the microbiome, we are talking about microbes that have changed their behavior in a changed terrain. They have undergone what's called pleomorphism. Uh, the term pleomorphism describes the idea that bacteria change morphology, biological systems and uh, reproductive methods dramatically according to its environmental cues. 
In other words, they look and behave differently. So again, in dysbiosis, some otherwise normal bacteria, they take over, they change their behavior according to a changed environment. And that's when dental problems start. And in case of dental plaque, it's trapped mutants. The environment is changed when we feed them sugar, it multiplies, turns plaque into a sticky layer and produces acids that is causing cavities in teeth. But not only that, it turns into a nasty bully. And it's just like in real life. Some normal guys turn ugly when you give them alcohol. Then they sway otherwise normal guys and they turn ugly too. And at that point, the good guys have left the party and all hell breaks loose. <laughs> and just as a side note, germ theory also has allowed for some very strange ideas too. One of them is that scientists have been working for a long, long time to find a vaccine against strep mutants to fight cavities. They, they haven't succeeded as far as I know. <laughs> And the other strange idea is that parents have been informed that they can infect their little ones with dental decay if they get too close to them. So, so remember, strep mutants is a normal inhabitant of the oral microbiome and cavities are not an infectious disease and babies can't catch decays. So, uh, and parents can still kiss their little ones. Here's another benefit of the healthy oral microbiome. It helps to produce the little gas called nitric oxide, which has multiple health benefits. Actually, too many to count in this presentation. Uh, just to mention one of the benefits, it's, it vasodilates the blood vessels, and by doing that, it's promoting healthy blood circulation and lowers blood pressure. Actually, people are saying uh, you shouldn't take mouthwash because it kills the microbiome and it might raise your blood pressure. So, by compromising the microbiome, we are depriving us from uh, this beneficial molecule. Now, how do we get from oral dysbiosis to a sick mouth and systemic problems? I have to take a sip of water. <laughs> Now, just asking, we are halfway through. Do we need a break, five minutes or something? Yeah? Hand raising for having a break? Okay. Okay, I keep going then. Okay, with the latest research into the microbiome, we can see what happens microbiologically. So, there are similar patterns in both tooth decay and gum disease. When the oral microbiome or the terrain is changed from homeostasis to dysbiosis, the plaque turns from oxygen rich to oxygen poor. And in fact, without oxygen, some bugs thrive and they turn pathogenic. Their toxins, they set inflammatory processes within teeth and gums in motion causing cavities and pockets in the gums and bone destruction around the roots. They are creating their own toxic microenvironments that are physically separated from the rest of the mouth. And this is where a vicious cycle starts with more proliferation of pathogens and tish tissue destruction. In other words, bigger holes and deeper pockets. And in these isolated niches, they can thrive and do their dirty business. And then they are forming a focal infection source that can spread through the body via the bloodstream, causing systemic problems. And this is what happens to teeth and gums during the process. Dysbiosis is causing, on the left, de demineralization and inflammation and causing cavities. And on the right we say that the gums are starting to be infected. Some early dental problems can be reversed given the right environment. So, uh, when we brush our teeth properly and gums properly and we are re-establishing homeostasis, these small cavities that are limited, like in, in this picture, that are limited to the outside surface, the enamel, they can remineralize. So, they, they don't necessarily need a filling at that point. And gum inflammation or gingivitis, uh, without any bone loss yet, 
uh, they can heal completely too. But however, with progressing tissue destruction, like with deeper cavities, and deep, uh, like on the left, we see a deep cavity that is involving even the root canal, or on the right with deep pockets and bone destruction with gum disease, uh, the toxic microenvironments, they are established and they are then isolated from the rest of the mouth. So this is when toxic microenvironments uh, develop in the mouth. And once the bugs are hidden deep in warm and moist pockets or cavities, they are, doing, uh, they are, they are causing the problems undisturbed. And that's when a vicious cycle starts with more proliferation of pathogens and tissue destruction. In other words, bigger cavities and deeper pockets. And this is what happens microbiologically in the gums. So you change the environment, the terrain, by eating sugar. And the initial colonizers of plaque, they depend on oxygen. However, in the, if the environment changes, let's say we eat junk food, the plaque gets thicker and the bacteria create conditions for more pathogenic uh, bacteria to flourish. And they are then not depending on oxygen anymore. And these later colonizers uh, are the ones hiding in the deep pockets and their toxins cause inflammatory processes and thereby the destruction of the bone and gum tissue. And these later varieties, they are more toxic locally, but they are also starting to become a problem systemically too, once they get into the bloodstream. Because these uh, later colonizers, uh, the, the really bad ones, they settle all over the body in different organs. This is explained by the focal infection theory. So what is the focal infection theory? It is when germs inf infect one part of the body and then they move to another area. And the most common focal infections are actually from dental sources. So here we see a dead tooth with an abscess could be a focal infection. So a tooth abscess develops when a cavity reaches the center of the tooth or the pulp. And the bacteria, they fester inside the tooth in a toxic microenvironment. They travel along, along the root into the bone at the end of the root and then they enter the blood vessels. So here we can see the close proximity uh, of the abscess to the blood vessels. Holistic health professionals are actually more concerned about the toxins that the bacteria produce than the bacteria itself. And this is the problem with root canal treated teeth. Because even after a, success, a successful root canal treatment, there will be bacteria left. They produce endotoxins that are more toxic for, to the system than the bacteria itself. So uh, there are after root canal there are always bacteria left. This is also admitted by dentists and uh, dental specialists and odontists. We cannot kill all the bacteria. So it's it's the last attempt to save a tooth, but it has all these problems attached to it because we cannot kill all the bacteria. The, the idea behind that treatment is to minimize the bacteria and hopefully the body can deal with it. Uh, but this is a whole different subject in itself and I'm happy to talk about that at another time. But moving on now to uh, gum disease or periodontitis, uh, which offers a different entry point for the bacteria into the system. When gums are inflamed, they start to bleed and they can wash germs and toxins into the bloodstream. So the normal, normally the tight and protective seal of the gums around the neck of the tooth loosens due to these inflammatory processes. So normally it's like this. Uh, the gums sit around the neck of the tooth really tightly like a turtleneck and nothing gets in there really. But if we have inflammation, what happens is that this tight seal opens up and then the pockets uh, between uh, the root of the tooth and the gums develop. 
The dentist measures these pockets with the, these specialized probes. So when the dentist is shouting out two millimeter, five millimeter and stuff like that, that's what he's doing. He's putting the probe into the pocket that you see there. And then he measures the millimeters and the deeper it goes, the worse the problem is. Bacteria in these deep pockets, uh, they live undisturbed in an isolated microenvironment. And the toothbrush doesn't get there anymore because the gums cover the area uh, and whatever is in the depth of the pocket is not cleaned away. And then bacteria, they can penetrate the thin mucosa and get into the bloodstream. And now we find these bad guys, the late colonizer, we find them, uh, th they all originate in the tooth and we don't find them uh, in a healthy environment. We don't find these bacteria settling uh, in other organs or we find them also in, in cancer cells sometimes. There is established co correlation between gum disease, heart disease, diabetes, increased risk for stroke, respiratory disease, osteoporosis, pregnancy problems and erectile dysfunction. So what can we do about all of that? As we know it starts with dental plaque and dental plaque has a life cycle. Early dental plaque is beneficial and good but the later stages they are destructive and as a general rule we need to prevent the thick sticky stuff to develop in the first place. However, if the thick and sticky stuff is visible on your teeth and you can feel it maybe with your tongue already, at that stage it needs to be removed. On the other hand, we don't want to destroy the oral microbiome. So what can we do? We need to be kind and reconcile with our bacterial community. We need to fluff our oral flora and befriend our body's bacteria. Unfortunately, there are many oral care products that disrupt the beneficial bacteria and suppress homeostasis. So what we need to do is we need to avoid toothpaste and mouthwash from the supermarket. They contain multiple chemicals that are nuking the oral microbiome. They follow a scorched earth policy. In the US, for example, toothpaste come with a warning label. So let's read this one. Warnings keep out of reach of children under six years of age. Because it's known that kids up to the age of six, they just swallow everything. Whatever they get into their mouth, they swallow it. So if more than used for brushing is accidentally swallowed, and that's only a piece, that should be a piece size uh, amount on the toothbrush. So if you small, swallow more than that, get, them, get medical help or contact a poison control center right away. So it's because of the sodium fluoride in them. That's how toxic it is. So if a child goes to the bathroom and likes the Colgate toothpaste so much that it eats it, all of it, this child will be in real trouble and their, its life will be at danger. So it will have the stomach pumped and in order to survive. That's, that's how bad this stuff is. Conventional toothpaste and mouthwash are a cocktail of toxic ingredients that are otherwise used, for example, to clean public toilets like the sodium lauryl sulfate or fluoride, which is a red poison and form aldehyde, which is uh, carcinogenic. It's pres for preserving dead tissue normally. And triclosane, which is a pesticide. Just to name a few, but there are also hormone disruptors in there and fire retardants for furniture. You can find those chemicals in those as well. So basically it's chemical warfare in your mouth and it has serious knock-on effects. It's also creating an antibiotic resistance for germs that survive the chemical onslaught. We absorb these toxic chemicals through the very, de very delicate skin of our mouth. And as a general rule, whatever goes into the mouth ends up in the body. Besides, oral care products are big business. So the global market value annually for toothpaste and mouthwash is above 30 billion dollars and big pharma is raking it in and these big pharma companies are 
very much involved in expensive dental research programs promoting oral hygiene products and fluoride. So don't risk your health and don't use these products. But uh, here are some thoughts also on alternative products. Uh, although there's good intentions behind them, they are often still conforming to germ theory. They can contain harsh concentrations of natural essential oils, still nuking the oral microbiome. And it seems uh, that they are trying to match their chemical competitors in their germ killing ability. So beware of these harsh alternative formulations. As a general rule, if it really tastes strong, even the essential oils, it might not be that good for, for the oral microbiome. And you can always formulate your own toothpaste. There's heaps of stuff online on in the internet, YouTube, uh, where you can research the ingredients and it's all under your control, whatever you put into the toothpaste. So mm, that is a good idea to go about it. But what do we do with this thick and sticky dental plaque? Uh, the time at the time when plaque is noticeable on your teeth. So if you if you you can go there with your fingernail, you can feel it. Yeah? At that time, it's old and toxic, and it needs to be removed for your teeth and gums to heal. And how do we remove the sticky stuff? Well, teeth and gums, they need to be cleaned mechanically and not chemically. There's a huge misconception that we need to use toothpaste and mouthwash. But in reality, it's way more important to develop mechanical skills to remove the thick and sticky plaque. Now here are some basics. Plaque likes to accumulate along the gum line. So, and it usually settles not so much on the smooth surfaces of the teeth. And those areas are also much easier to clean and they keep themselves clean also much e easier when the tongue goes there or when the cheeks and the lips rub on them. However, the gum line provides a niche where the plaque likes to accumulate. That's why the focus when we brush our teeth should be along the gum line and between teeth. So two out of three dental problems, they start between teeth. And depending on the size between teeth, we can use either dental floss or interdental brushes. This is so important to dental health because if we don't address the space between teeth, we are not addressing two out of three problems. Uh, and unfortunately, in my 30 plus years of experience, I noticed that most people just don't get it right. They religiously brush twice a day but often they don't get to the right spots and uh, the, the spots that are a bit more challenging to clean. I did a video called how to clean teeth and gums properly and I would like to show a short version of that right now uh, just so that you know what I'm talking about. So let's see if I can play this. When we brush our teeth it's important to clean mechanically and not chemically. And we can use either a hand, a manual brush or an electric toothbrush for the teeth and the gum line. And in between teeth we can use either dental floss or an interdental toothbrush. And there are some basic rules that we need to follow. Start brushing with the very back tooth, move from tooth to tooth and finish with the back tooth on the other side and the toothbrush follows the gum line. And now we have to brush in three rounds. The first round is to brush the outside along the gum line. The second round is to brush the inside along the gum line. And the third round is to brush the chewing surfaces. And then we need to clean between teeth, either with floss or with the little toothbrushes. And this is the gum line. This is where most of the plaque accumulates. So that's why the toothbrush follows the gum line. We can use a manual brush and we use uh, circular motions around the gum line. So first round is on the outside, second round is on the inside. Again we start with the very back tooth and circular motions. And then the third round is the chewing surfaces. 
Or we can use an electric one. We start behind the very back tooth and then we follow the gum line with the toothbrush. Again we start in the very back, we work our way to the front teeth and all the way to the very back tooth and then we finish off behind the back tooth. And then the second round. We move the toothbrush to the very back tooth between the tongue and the teeth and we do the same. We start, follow the gum line until we get to the very back tooth on the other side and behind the very back tooth. And then the third round is the chewing surfaces. Now we need to brush between teeth and again we start in the very back tooth. So we can use dental floss and we start behind the very back tooth and then in between teeth we start the front of one tooth and the back of the next tooth. And we finish behind the back tooth. Or we use the interdental one. There are two different sorts. So the classic one is which is a bit like a bottle brush and then the newer models which are silicon ones. Starting between the very back teeth with the interdental ones and uh, in between goes between those teeth you can rinse the brush with water. And this is the silicon one, which cleans also very well. So that's all you have to do to get good results brushing your teeth. Yeah? yeah? Mm -hmm. Cool. So here's the thing. If you brush your teeth or between teeth and you notice some bleeding, yeah, that means that your gums are inflamed. Healthy gums, they should not bleed. So please don't stop at that point because many people think, oh, it's bleeding, something is wrong. Yeah, wrong. You need to keep going because the bleeding should stop. Uh, because when, when you keep going, what you're doing is you're removing the plaque from along the gum line and from in between your teeth. And that's where the gums have the chance to heal. It might take a few days, but after a few days, the gums should have healed and then the bleeding should stop. Uh, if you cannot resolve the bleeding with brushing alone or with brushing in between teeth and it keeps going with the bleeding, then someone needs to look at it because then there might be a deep, deeper issue. And also, if you haven't done so yet, start using a tongue scraper. Because according to Ayurvedic medicine, it's very beneficial for your overall health. And you, if you haven't done so yet, you might be uh, surprised what will come off of your tongue. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's oil pulling, so which also has its root in Ayurvedic medicine and is very popular these days. It claims to have multiple health benefits by detoxifying your body. But just be aware, when you, have, when you do this technique and you're swishing the oil between your teeth, you need to remove the plaque and the buildup first. Because uh, if you don't remove the plaque first and there's plaque between your teeth or on your gums, the good and beneficial oil doesn't get really where it's supposed to get and do its healing things. So teeth must be clean, gums must be clean before you do that. What about professional scale and clean? Well, we know that we need to remove the plaque uh, and then there's calculus. Uh, by the way, calculus equals tata. That's the same, different words. That also needs to be removed, but it requires a different approach. So the early plaque, that's what we want, but we need to interrupt the big plaque, the, the thicker plaque from happening. However, if this plaque is not removed, it can turn into calculus. That happens when the calcium and the phosphate in the saliva, they penetrate the plaque and they mineralize it. And then it's rock hard. Uh, and that's, these are the hard deposits on your teeth that are strongly bonded to the teeth. The tartar, the calculus, it still contains all the bacteria. It is constantly irritating the gums because it's rock hard. And 
it needs to be removed professionally because brushing will not get rid of it. Like in this case, you can see this, uh, this is uh, a client of mine that I saw and you can see this is typical. This is what dentists see every day, 100 times, 10 times maybe. So anyway, you can see the yellow collar of hard deposits around uh, the teeth. And you can see that it's quite thick and it has pushed the gums away from the tooth. Now on the left, I just have removed that, which is very easy with dental instruments. But you can see how inflamed the gums look underneath and how they have been pushed downwards by the buildup. On the right, I just left for demonstration purposes and for a good picture, I left it. Uh, so that you can see what the difference is. So again, it's uh, again I come back to the picture of the tur turtleneck, yeah, turtleneck tightly around the tooth. Nothing gets in, but in an inflammation, it opens, and this is what what you see here that the calculus is then growing under the gums. It 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 it's like a wedge that makes its way downwards into the gums, and slips into the pockets. So this is when the dentist has the probe and goes deeper into the pockets. That's what the dentist is measuring. So healthy gums is when the when the probe goes up to three millimeters. So if the dentist or the hygienist shouts out three millimeter or below, then you're good. But any deeper is considered not healthy anymore. Now this is 12 millimeters and that's extreme and it comes with this is a severe case of gum disease uh, and the bone levels have also dropped. So, and that is the problem with gum disease. Uh, the bone is the, uh, if the bone is destroyed, then the bone is the foundation that anchors the teeth firmly in the jawbone. But if the bone is gone because of gum disease, teeth can become loose. And again, the toothbrush does not clean what's in the depth of the pocket. This is a computer image, but it shows what a tooth would be looking like in the depth of the pocket. And you see the tartar or the calculus is strongly attached to the tooth. It's very tenacious and only dental instruments or these, uh, what you see on the left, or the, the ultrasonic scaler, which everyone hates so much, uh, that can remove it. What about saliva? Saliva has a crucial role in maintaining a healthy oral environment. Generally speaking, a tooth that is bathed in saliva gets all the nutrients and minerals it needs to stay healthy. However, if the tooth is somehow covered with plaque, the saliva doesn't get to the tooth anymore. So saliva maintains a good pH level so that the mouth does not turn acidic and it has enzymes in it that have antimicrobial properties. So it fends off some unwanted intruders. Therefore, it's always important to stay hydrated and make sure that you don't mouth breathe uh, because mouth breathing will dry out the mouth. Now, mouth breathing is a big one because uh, for many, many reasons. It's actually the melody of our time. It's related to crooked teeth, small mouths and poor facial development, snoring, grinding and sleep apnea. Now, uh, next time when I come, uh, I will talk a little bit about more about mouth breathing. But now back to saliva. Uh, sour fruit and chewing gum will also promote more saliva production. I'm a little bit in two minds with the chewing gum because it seems so artificial to me, to me but it has benefits. It, it um, somehow trains your muscles, which is we don't train our chewing muscles very much with the soft food that we eat and also it causes saliva to flow. So make up your own mind. <laughs> what about nutrition and food? Nutrition is the bedrock of good health and a healthy mouth. It's a vast and complex issue and it's a talk of its own. But uh, I would just generally speaking, what is good for your oral health is also good for your teeth. Actually, it's all about nutrition, and if we don't get this right, our teeth will suffer. Now, there are some basics that I will mention. Generally speaking, foods that are rich in fat-soluble vitamins, so A, D, E, and K, they are al uh, so we need alkalizing food and anti-inflammatory food and 
food that are rich in antioxidants. For example, organic food and vegetables, uh, natural organically raised meat, meat and fish and poultry and eggs, and eating and drinking fermented foods on a regular basis is good, like sauerkraut or kombucha or dill pickles, and using filtered water. That's also an important one. So if you cook uh, or drink, then just use filtered water. Uh, food nutrition and its impact on physical development and dental health will be part of my next talk. And this is Dr. Weston A. Price. He is central to our knowledge regarding food and nutrition. He was a dentist from Cleveland, Ohio, and he traveled the world to find the secret of healthy people. And that was more than a century ago, or about a century ago. And his findings, they were truly amazing. So what he did is, in the 20s of last century, he traveled around the world to some, some old cultures like the Aborigines or the people from the Amazons or the Eskimos, or he also went to the remote uh, uh, valleys of, of the Swiss Alp. And he saw people that were on the cusp of our modern civilization. So some family members were maybe traveling already to the closest cities and getting really bad food to eat. And other family members might stay at home and live the traditional way with their good old foods. And he documented the difference that he saw. And it's it's quite staggering what he found. And uh, yeah, so I will talk about that a little later, a little uh, next time when I come. So again, if you please do your own research, then you will also know what's the right thing for you to do. And this is an excellent book. It's by Dr. Stephen <coughs> Lynn, it's called The Dental Diet. You, you will find whatever you need in regards to good and healthy nutrition on a, for, for your teeth, but also for your general health. <coughs> so I'm coming now to the end of the talk, but uh, earlier on I spoke about this guy and our involvement in the fascinating project that we're doing right now. A year ago, we approached this man. His name is Phoenix Aurelius, and we asked him to work with us to create a holistic mouth elixir. So Phoenix draws his experience from the traditions of Ayurveda, Tibetan medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, and even pre-traditional Chinese medicine, which is called Taoist medicine. And we shared our ideas. And what our ideas were, we wanted to create something that does not conform to the ideas of germ theory. Uh, but rather create something completely holistic uh, for the entire dental system, which is not aiming at killing bacteria. So with our non-pathogenic approach to oral health, we step far away from germ theory. Uh, and our health serum, uh, which co uh, contains very beneficial botanicals in very mild concentrations, to balance out the oral microbiome and to strengthen organ systems and qualities relating to traditional Chinese medicine. And these, uh, these qualities are relevant and supportive to the oral system and oral health in general. So we were also approaching it from the Western side of nutritional medicine. We added some vitamin D3 and K2 to help with the parathyroid, parathyroid calcium exchange. Most people are deficient in these vitamins, especially people with dental problems. And uh, vitamin D and K2 are essential for healthy teeth as well. We researched long and hard and found sources for vitamin D3 and K2 that are not just bioavailable but bioidentical forms. They are good for absorption through the mucosa and uh, the product is actually ingestible, so we encourage people to swallow it. It tastes good and it's very healthy too. And there's a special role for the vitamin D3 and K2 in health for bone and teeth. They work together synergistically, so you shouldn't really take D3 by itself. You always should complement it with K2 because the D3 helps to absorb the calcium in the intestines but the K2 makes sure that the calcium is deposited in the bones and in the teeth and it doesn't clog up the arteries because calcium likes to go into the soft tissue 
and we need to pull it out of that. There is actually research that uh, that women uh, who took calcium supplements by by itself for osteoporosis they had higher incidences of uh, uh, of heart disease problems because it's clogging up the arteries. So we need somehow to to direct the calcium that we absorb through the intestines. They need to be pulled out of the soft tissue and be put into the bones and into the teeth. As otherwise, they can do harm. So it's a multi-purpose product. You can, sw uh, you can swish it around, uh, you can put it on the toothbrush and you can brush with it and you can soak the floss in it or the, the dental brushes and use it that way. And we encourage people to swallow it. It has a mild taste and good flavor and as I said, it's, uh, it's balancing for the entire system. And it also promotes saliva flow, even for uh, quite a long time after you swished with it in your mouth, it still produces some saliva. So if you're interested in this kind of healing philosophy, you, I had an interview with Phoenix Aurelius on my website, and it's fascinating to listen to this guy because he is so full of knowledge and he's such a wonderful man. Finally, to make my point clear today, in health it's all about knowledge. Make sure that we are not deceived by any narratives that don't have our best interest at heart. Do your own research. The information is out there. No one can do it for you and no one will do it for you. So it's your responsibility, it's our responsibility. Let's not rely on the system because the system is broken. We need to do our own legwork and we need to learn what is the right thing for us and our families on so many levels. So thank you for listening. Thank you.